it has long not made sense to me that the remedy for somebody breaking the law is that they would lose their ability to cast um, what was defined by our uh, the founding the founders of our country as a God-given right, um, which is the right to vote. There are 6.1 million people who have lost their right to vote in our country. Uh, and it's because of um, felony charges and it threatens our very democracy, it threatens our values, it threatens who we are as a society. And welcome to this evening's program. I'm Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. I'm delighted that you have joined us for this evening's back-to-back -back forums on justice reform with Democratic candidates for the United States Senate, Congressman Joe Kennedy and Senator Ed Markey. Ford Hall Forum is the oldest continuously operating free lecture series in America. This evening, Suffolk University continues to honor the storied legacy of the forum by presenting programs such as this evening's that illuminates key issues facing our country and the world today. I wish to thank Congressman Joe Kennedy and Senator Ed Markey for participating in this important exchange on justice reform. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Love Williams, a formerly incarcerated trans woman of color who serves as the co-chair of the working group formerly incarcerated people for Black and Pink National. She's also the creator and founder of the Gen Love Project, which provides care packages to recently released and soon to be released LBGTQ people in Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. Jen? Good evening and a warm welcome to all. This town meeting is no accident. It's the result of a community-based organization whose core are prison abolitionists working together to create a community that serves us all. Tonight, our panelists will ask you questions that are closest to their hearts. We have lived through racist and abusive policing and the prison system itself. We have witnessed our families and neighbors gobbled up by the same system. Tonight, we will ask you questions that will set the stage to unravel these old policies and craft new and life-sustaining ones. Each day we fight to create the kind of community that we will all want to live in, one which is resourced with housing, education, and transportation, one that allows transformation and genuine heal healing for the traumas and neglect we endure at the hands of the government. We want our government to be accountable to us, inclusive to Black people, First Nation people, people of color, transgender people, sex workers, drug users, and the unsheltered. Our coalition includes the Boston Chapter of Black and Pink, the Charles Hamilton Institute for Race and Justice, Citizens for Juvenile Justice, Disability Action, Families for Justice as Healing, Sisters Unchained, SWAP Boston, the Young Professional Network of the Urban League of Massachusetts, and the National Council of Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. This is a special organization led by Andrea James, who I have the pleasure of introducing, introducing to you tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Andrea James. First, I do want to mention the fact that it is also historic for us as formerly incarcerated people because it is opening the door and beginning to build the platform of what we refer to as the People's Assembly process, which is important in that it creates an opportunity for people who are elected to office, who are representing our communities, particularly our black and brown communities that have been most directly affected, that our electeds now um, going forward, come into a community space and have a conversation with all of us to determine uh, the way forward in terms of uh, carrying our, our concerns and our messages and our voices. So again, thank you very much. Without further ado, we're going to jump right to it. I'm going to uh, introduce our Congressman Joe Kennedy III. Congressman Joe Kennedy is serving his fourth term representing Massachusetts 4th District and is currently 
a U.S. Senate candidate, a former Peace Corps member, legal aid volunteer, and assistant district attorney. He serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and he's established a national leadership on the issues of health care, economic justice, and civil rights. Congressman Joe Kennedy has dedicated his career to social and economic justice and is fighting for the basic dignity of every American family and a politics that is inclusive, representative, and fair. Congressman Kennedy, thank you for joining us and welcome. Andrea, I am so grateful um, for the introduction. I'm grateful for the invitation. I am honored to be able to join you and uh, your audience and um, the folks that are gonna participate in this discussion this evening. Uh, I think it's a critically important one and uh, I salute uh, you and uh, all of you uh, folks that came together to make this possible um, uh, to be able to, uh, to engage us uh, in this important discussion. I also wanna thank uh, Susan and the, uh, uh, the Fort Hall Forum uh, you guys are an incredible institution here in, in Boston and, and provide an opportunity for a critical uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, to Jennifer Love Williams, uh, thank you as well uh, for, for having me this evening. Um, I'll keep these comments uh, relatively brief because I do want to uh, get to your questions in the, in the overall discussion. But uh, I did want to touch on why I got in this race and what I think is so uh, important about this moment. And I jumped in to a Democratic primary against a sitting United States Senator because I believe that in order for uh, Massachusetts and our country to see the change that we need, we're going to need stronger leadership in government and stronger leadership in the United States Senate. Because the fact is, that, and I believe that nine months ago, 10 months ago, when I got in this race, when there were 500,000 people that were homeless and there were 37 million that were going hungry, when the largest providers of mental and behavioral health care in our nation were the jails in LA and Chicago. And I believe that even more so now. Because over the course of the past several months, we have seen 150,000 people die, largely uh, uh, from a virus that affects disproportionately black and brown and immigrant communities. We have seen uh, over 4 million get sick. We have seen a country that allowed George Floyd to die. And we have a criminal justice system and a civil justice system that compound these inequities uh, day after day. And those were some of the lessons that I learned uh, as a legal aid volunteer working in uh, Boston Housing Court uh, for several years when I was in law school. I was there in the midst of the foreclosure crisis back in 2008 and 2009. And uh, I was there every Thursday on eviction day trying to keep uh, families uh, in their homes. Clients that I served were uh, often single moms. Oftentimes English was not their first language. And seeing a a housing court system, a justice system through their eyes where for those that were able to access a lawyer, um, they got one outcome and some aspects of justice. For those that did not, um, they were often left out on the streets. For those that perhaps had a, in contact with uh, our justice system before, for those that were scared of what that might be, the bullying, uh, the intimidation, the threats, um, the fact that somebody would just dangle uh, a few bucks in front of their in front of them and threaten them that if they did not leave, then they would, uh, their life would be destroyed. Despite the fact that the rights of those tenants and the rights uh, that I would have had had I been in that courtroom would have been the same, but access to them uh, resulted in a justice denied day after day after day. It's what got me interested in our justice system and is why I ended up working in a uh, prosecutor's office. And as an entry level prosecutor for two and a half years or so, um, I saw every single day the compounding impacts of poverty, of mental behavioral health, uh, of addiction, every single day in our courtroom. Uh, it was what has led me to champion the cause of mental behavioral health care in Congress, to found a caucus based on, to actually fund our legal aid system and increase funding for legal services. It's what led me to uh, author numerous pieces of legislation, including just recently a resolution to structurally overhaul our mental behavioral health care system. Because as the sheriffs across our Commonwealth will tell us and have told me, on any given night, 80 to 90% of the incarcerated individuals in our, uh, in our jails suffer from substance use disorder or mental illness. The compounding impact, of the fact that two thirds of the women in state prison in our nation are single mothers or are mothers. Uh, Thank we you, have Chris. to address. Thank you, oh, I'm sorry, I just got a one minute time check. So anyway, thank you very much. Appreciate it, look forward to your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman, so very much. We are going to jump right to uh, Ms. Jennifer Love, who is going to introduce our panelists who are asking questions and move us forward. Jennifer. Thank you. 
First panelist is Romelda Pereira, who is a formerly incarcerated Boston resident, a mother of two, and a director of programs at Families for Justice as Healing. Romilda, your question. Thank you. Congressman Joe Kennedy, in April 2020, Andrea Circlebeer, serving a 26 month federal sentence for drugs, died as a result of COVID 19. Just 28 days after giving birth via C section while on a ventilator. In addition to her newborn daughter, she left behind five other children. Her 26 month drug sentence turned into a death sentence, leaving her children without their mother. Six states, including Massachusetts, have passed parenting sentencing alternatives to divert parents and caregivers from incarceration into programs that would better serve them and their families. We hear that after the August congressional recess, a federal parenting sentencing alternative bill will be introduced by Rep Representative Jayapal and Senator Wyden. Will you support that bill? And also, have you supported the current ask for appropriations for states working on parenting sentencing alternatives? Uh, uh, Romilda, yes? Yes, yes so um, th thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, the story that you tell is horrifying. And under no circumstances should a 26 month should <laughs> Should a 26 month sentence or any sentence uh, of that nature end up uh, in death behind bars? No. And so, um, yes, uh, I do. I have supported that appropriation. Uh, I, yes, I um, support, um, as you described, the bill being put forth by Pramila Jayapal, and I will certainly take a look at it after it's uh, filed. I haven't seen the text of it at this point, but let me be very clear about this. Um, our system needs to do more to recognize the lived reality and experiences of uh, families that are subject to our criminal justice system. Incarcerating those individuals, particularly if you are the sole caregiver, means not just a system, uh, one other individual that is incarcerated, it means a broken family. It means children in foster care or living with somebody else. It means enormous amount of stress and strain on children. That is not, that should not be the intent of our system. And to the extent that that is what is happening, it needs to be reformed. It needs to be reformed immediately. I would love to be able to work with, I work uh, very closely with Ms. Jayapal on a number of issues, particularly on immigration and healthcare. Uh, I will look forward to engaging with her uh, tomorrow about this piece of legislation and certainly look forward to supporting it. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Jarrell Lornell, who was a formerly incarcerated organizer at Families for Justice as Healing, and a survivor of solitary confinement, who focuses on implementing alternative responses to interpersonal harm outside of police and prisons. Jarrell, your question. Congressman Kennedy, two years after the passage of the First Step Act, We've continued to see the Trump administration aggressively prosecute and sentence individuals for drugs while slow walking or failing to exercise its authority to grant home confinement to individuals at high risk for COVID-19. Even here in Massachusetts, during the pandemic, when the economy has been flatlined, there is increased funding to the Department of Corrections, yet no meaningful investments to black and brown communities. In addition, Massachusetts Governor Baker is proposing to build a new $50 million women's prison, and there's a, a proposal for a new jail in Suffolk County. You have stated the need to consider alternatives to incarceration. However, you have also stated the need to restructure law enforcement to assist people who are struggling. Where do you stand on the reallocation of resources to communities and do you support the campaign to stop the new women's prison in Massachusetts until we first determine what else is possible to decarcerate women and shift the $50 million prison building budget into community-led initiatives? Uh, Jarrell, um, sir, yes. Short answer, yes. Um, the, as I stated in partial response to that last question, um, what we have seen over the course of the course of our nation's history, the systemic and, and deliberate underinvestment in communities of color uh, across our nation. Um, 
what we need to do at this moment is not continue to invest money in incarceration. It's send money, uh, make sure that we are designated money to communities to make sure that we actually prevent incarceration in the first place. And there's myriad programs that obviously uh, can assist with that, but from issues uh, around access to mental and behavioral health care, which again has been one of my major areas of focus, to education, to equal uh, and equitable access to early child care and early childhood education. The, the cost of early child care in this state is one of 28 states where it exceeds the cost of sending a child to college year on year. You got 18 years to save for one, you got nine months to figure it out for the other. Study after study will show you that it's some of the best dollars that we could spend rather than and building a, new jails and looking at uh, cum or, uh, punitive treatment, we should be investing in, in structures to ensure that every single child, every family has a chance to actually succeed in this nation. And so, yes, I wholeheartedly would support uh, that campaign to ensure that we are making the requisite investments in our community before we decide to build yet another jail to incarcerate more women. Thank you, Congressman. Go ahead, Jen. Next up, we have Leslie Creedle a formerly incarcerated mother who lost her daughter to gun violence while she was incarcerated inside a federal prison. Good evening, Congressman Kennedy. You publicly stated that you support ending life without parole in Massachusetts and on the federal level for minors only. As a survivor mom who was incarcerated when my 22-year-old daughter Brianna was killed by violence, yet does not believe in locking people up and throwing away the key. From experience, I know that prisons do not equate to individual accountability and public safety. Rep. Kennedy, would you publicly call for Massachusetts and federally to end life without parole sentences for everyone? Ma'am, uh, yes. Um, and this is an issue I've thought an awful lot about. Um, uh, the um, violence has obviously touched uh, um, far too many American families. Um, and um, this one candidly has been uh, one that I've had to wrestle with. Um, man who um, killed a member of my own family is uh, still currently incarcerated, but he was given an option for parole. Um, Ma'am, I um, thought about this a lot of late. I recently uh, came out in favor of ending life without parole sentences um, for everybody. I do think it is important to make sure that voices of victims and victims' families are heard uh, in those parole hearings. Uh, I think it's important that those voices uh, are given the, the audience that they need. Um, I also think that for folks that have been um, incarcerated for 50, 60, sometimes longer, years, 70, uh, years or longer, that um, they should be given the chance to be able to make the case for their liberty. Um, but this one, that, um, I want to make sure those victims' uh, voices are, are heard in that process. Thank you. Next, we have Quinn, who was a survivor of incest, who entered the sex trade at 15 after leaving her home, and is now an organizer with the Sex Workers Outreach Project of Boston. Quinn, your question. Hello, Congressman. I come to you hidden because the criminalization of me and my fellow workers makes it dangerous to show my face. I come to you hidden, but I have never been voiceless. In 2018, I and thousands of my fellow workers lobbied, called, and organized to prevent the passage of FOSTA-SESTA, a bill that claimed to hold online platforms accountable for the role in sex trafficking. 
without consideration for the necessity of these platforms for the protection and well-being of both consensual sex workers and trafficking victims. As a coalition, we opposed the bill as it resulted in sex workers being systematically removed from internet platforms, taking away our ability to control how we work and destroyed the networks that we relied on for safety and security. Workers became more vulnerable as we simultaneously lost our income and resources that allowed us to communicate with and protect one another, leading to more of us in poverty, more of us living on the streets, more of us being trafficked, and even some of us killed. Now that FOSTA SESTA is law and causing further harm from the perspective of those it was intended to protect, and in light of the advancing new federal bill, the PROTECT Act, that we continue to be concerned about, do you support the full decriminalization of sex work on the state and federal level? Quinn, yes, I do. Um, and um, I've heard from uh, advocates and activists, um, voices like yours, um, that have uh, helped me understand that perhaps the best of intentions of the uh, FOSTA SESTA debate that it um, it has led to a um, a more dangerous um, reality for um, sex workers um, and has put their safety at, at risk and that's obviously the last thing in the world we, we want to do um, and if there is an example of um, uh, of a, an industry that is going to persist despite the fact that it is illegal, um, it might be sex work. And so I, um, I've reached out to a number of, as I said, advocates and activists over the course of the last several months and done my best to study this issue. Um, I do believe that it is time has come to decriminalize um, and to legalize um, uh, sex work. I do, however, Quinn, Think that we need to, and I, I would welcome your feedback on how to do this right. Um, I think it's important how we make sure there are still the adequate protections, um, and uh, I believe, uh, in all likelihood, uh, criminal penalties for sex trafficking. Right? What we don't want is a system that ends up in, in a, uh, a greater degree of exploitation. Um, so I want to make sure we get the um, we are able to make sure that. Um, people are going to be able to operate safely, securely, um, while also protecting those that might be subject to exploitation. And I think there's a way to do that. Um, but I would welcome your feedback, Quinn, and, and feedback from other advocates and activists to make sure we actually get that right. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Harold Adams, who is a formerly incarcerated person and the founder of Boston Committees of Friends and Relatives of Prisoners. Harold, your question. Uh, Congressman Kennedy, um, I became a, a jailhouse lawyer in prison. Um, mm -hmm. I was able to get seven people out of prison through studying the law. The Constitution affords the right of access to courts. No other politically unpopular group has had their access to the courts restricted in the way that incarcerated people have. To, to ensure that all incarcerated persons can pursue legal remedies to unjust conditions, would you author or co-sponsor legislation to repeal the Prison Litigation Act to ensure all incarcerated persons can pursue legal remedies to unjust conditions? Yeah. Um, without question. And, um, sir, first off, um, it's an honor to be with you. Um, thank you for sharing that story and for your incredible work. Um, to use a lot of, um, to try to actually bring about justice, uh, particularly for those that, um, where an injustice was done. Um, the fact is that, um, our system has systematically and again strategically intentionally and deliberately limited the rights of incarcerated individuals um which um, sir as i was learning more about this is a bit baffling that we would put greater 
greater protections on uh, civil rights like habeas corpus to prisoners rather than actually expand them to make sure that the, that somebody that is incarcerated actually has an increased access to those rights because we want to make sure that people that are incarcerated aren't there wrongfully, unjustly, or um, uh, in error. And if there's evidence of such a thing, we should have a system that actually encourages that that semblance or, or that sort of review. Um, so yes, absolutely. And I've been working with my staff now for um, a couple of months on legislation that um, should look at that. So we're not quite, we're not, not ready to introduce it yet, but we're working on it um, because I do think it's critically important. Thank you, sir. Okay, next we have Cassandra Bin Sahib, who is the coordinator for Massachusetts Against Solitary and the senior organizer for Unitarian Universalist Mass Action Network and a formerly incarcerated mother and a member of Families for Justice as Healing, who has been working on criminal reform for 11 plus years. Cassandra, your question. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello, Congressman Kennedy. My question is, solitary confinement has been in practice in jails and prisons <clears throat> under various names, such as SHU, Segregated Housing Unit, SMU, Special Management Units, DDU, the Department Disciplinary Unit, Administrative Segregation, and Restrictive Housing. Solitary confinement is disproportionately used against black and brown people, people with disabilities, LGBTQ plus individuals, religious minorities, people with mental illness and ICE detainees. Studies have shown regardless of what it's called, short and long-term isolation causes lasting physical and psychological harm to men, women, and children on top of the trauma of being incarcerated. Solitary confinement has been recognized as a form of torture by the United Nations. My question to you is, would you author or co-sponsor legislation to end the torturous practice of solitary confinement? Yes, ma'am. Um, and I think you stated it beautiful uh, and accurately. Um, this is a practice that has been recognized as uh, by international bodies as torture. It has, um, it is inhumane. Um, the idea that we would somehow take somebody that was uh, either physically or intellectually disabled or somehow um, different and think that the appropriate way of, of, of keeping them was going to be leave them alone locked up is um, for uh, extended periods of time on end is somehow the appropriate way to treat a human being is ludicrous. <laughs> um, and so, yes, um, short answer, full stop. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for your work. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Congressman. And thank you, Congressman. We are going to um, introduce uh, Mr. Derek Washington. Mr. Derek Washington, Congressman, is incarcerated at Susan Baranowski uh, Prison in Massachusetts. He's serving a life without parole sentence and working to restore the voting rights of incarcerated people. You may remember that until very recently, incarcerated people in Massachusetts had the right to vote. Um, and Derek is doing a lot of work leading the campaign uh, to restore the voting rights of incarcerated people. So let's hear from Derek. Hi, my name is Derek Washington, and it's indeed a pleasure just to have this opportunity to share my thoughts and provide some insight about incarcerated suffrage. Um, at Sousa Baranowski, these conditions are horrible. It's beyond punishment. It's, it's continuous torture, to say the least. I believe the conditions are the way they are because we don't have representation. Representation simply just being able to pick the people who make the laws that govern our everyday environments. And because we can't do that, we don't have representatives, we don't have legislators, we don't have public officials coming in here looking at the food we eat, the brown water we drink, 
us not being able to see our mothers, our kids, our families, our siblings for months on end. We're locked down 30 plus hours from day to day recreation. We have racist CEOs, openly racist, who come to work and express their hate towards black and brown people that they can't express on in society because there's camera phones to capture all the bullshit, the, the BS that they do. But I think voting, in fact, I'm sure voting, having that representation will be a way to snuff that behavior out. And I think a society is only as good as those at the bottom of it. So to invest into society is to is is to invest into those incarcerated by providing them the vote, teaching them to value their society by allowing them to engage in civic duties, teaching them, educating them. So my position is, where do y'all stand on incarcerated suffrage? Because without suffrage, we're suffering. Mr. Washington, um, it's a... I'm grateful that you made the time to, um, to speak with me tonight, um, and thank you for your advocacy. I I agree. Um, I don't. Um, it has long not made sense to me that the remedy for somebody breaking the law is that they would lose their ability to cast um, what was defined by our uh, the founding the founders of our country as a God-given right, um, which is the right to vote. And so I, um, I agree that incarcerated individuals um, should have that right and will work to make sure that is, that is the case. And thank you for your work, sir. Thank you, Congressman. We are moving from our panelist questions now, and we are going to open up the questions from our audience. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start with the uh, first question, uh, Representative Kennedy. You've emphasized the urgent need for change during your campaign, uh, but just two years ago, when there were multiple opportunities to support progressive reform and change candidates, especially in the area of justice, including Rachel Rollins for Suffolk County DA, Ayanna Presley for Congress, and Nika a Lugado for state rep. In each and every case, you stood with the status quo candidates and against, and against the reform and change candidates. How do you reconcile that? So, uh, Mr. Hellman, thank you for the question. Um, I, um, uh, I'm proud of my record campaigning for um, colleagues that have, in fact, brought about change across our country. Um, the uh, whether it's Lauren Underwood in, in Illinois or Colin Allred in Texas or um, uh, and many others across uh, our, our nation um, that helped us flip the House of Representatives, actually uh, hold this administration accountable through uh, impeachment, um, pass progressive legislation like um, uh, cracking down on gun violence, like um, the critical uh, uh, democracy reforms, like uh, protecting the Voting Rights Act, expanding the Voting Rights Act. Um, ending uh, uh, political gerrymandering, uh, uh, climate change legislation, and others. With regards to the um, specifics that you you mentioned, um, look, I um, uh, I think the uh, the races that you mentioned, Ayanna uh, Congressman Presley uh, uh, is a friend. Um, uh, Michael Capuano was a, a colleague and a mentor. Um, Congressman Presley was a um, her first job in office was for my father. Um, it was a very tough choice. Um, and ultimately I made a decision to um, support Mr. Capuano because I, I thought that leadership was important in Massachusetts. I never for a second doubted what Congresswoman Presley would bring to uh, bring to Massachusetts and she has done that and more. Um, and so I'm, I'm proud of the record that I've, uh, I've put forth in campaigning for uh, change candidates around the nation and put that up against um, anybody else in this race. Um, the, uh, my opponent in this race, the incumbent uh, senator, did not support those any of the individuals that you mentioned um, either. Our next question is from registration, came in through registration, and it was sent in uh, at the time of registration. Uh, Congressman, you are a co-sponsor of the MORE Act, and you sit on one of the main committees, Energy and Commerce in the House. 
the bill hasn't moved because you asked for a second hearing directly uh, for a second hearing. Directly affected people are asking if you would waive jurisdiction on the bill so it can be voted on in September, like advocates have been fighting for. Will you commit to waiving jurisdiction? So let's get that clear. I, I've been pushing for the bill to actually move through. The, the bill is, is held up in the Judiciary Committee, not Energy and Commerce. Um, I've been pushing to actually get a hearing on it so that we can move it through. I, I don't, I'm not the one that actually is able to claim a waived jurisdiction, but whatever it takes, I've talked to advocates about this. However, I can push to move that bill through, I'm happy to do so. I'm a proud co-sponsor of the legislation. So if there's, if there's some confusion over that, I'm happy to clear that up with anybody uh, uh, offline afterwards. Um, the advocates that I've talked to, um, I mean, I, I called for that hearing um, in consultation with advocates, not to try to prevent the, the moving of uh, the moving of the legislation, but to enhance the, the pace with which we could actually get the bill passed. Thank you, Congressman. So just to be clear, I think the person asking the question, I didn't want to misread their question. They, they were clear about understanding that you don't sit on, that, that the bill is not in um, the committee. Um, the, yeah, the bill is, the bill the bill is, the bill is not in energy and commerce, uh, but, right. that, but that their understanding was that you had requested a second hearing prior to the bill being voted on. And they were asking if you were going to, to move for that bill to be heard, to be voted yes, on. Yes, and just what my point was, was I called for that hearing to make sure that we could move the bill forward, not delay it. So whatever, I'm happy to engage with, uh, whoever it is that, um, that reached out about this question, the intent on this was to actually move the bill, not delay it. And my, my point on this was that this would actually accelerate the passage of the bill, not put up barriers to it. So I'm happy to, to chat offline about if there's a disagreement in that strategy, I'm happy to engage with it. My, I support the legislation. I'm trying to move the legislation. So if yeah. people think that that's another way to do it, then great. And, and just let me be very clear about this. I don't, I'm not the chairman of that committee. I don't get to decide whether we waive or not, but if that's what folks think is gonna be needed in order to move the legislation more quickly, I'm happy to, I'm happy to engage in that conversation and I, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to help move that bill. So Thank you. let's make that clear. Like whatever I can do to help move it, I'll, I'm happy to do. Okay, great. Um, yeah. I, just also, I just also wanted to present the question as it was asked. No, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It, it, I, Thank you, Con. Yes. Yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, from the uh, question and answers is LGBTQ plus prisoners face some of the highest rates of sexual violence while in custody. Unfortunately, a law that was meant to protect incarcerated people, PREA, is often used as a weapon against the people. It is meant to protect. Will you work with Black and Pink Boston to file legislation to make this law better and with a focus on protecting LGBTQ plus people who are incarcerated? Yes, absolutely. Um, and look, this bill does not go far enough to, the legislation does not go far enough to protect LGBTQ plus um, incarcerated individuals. That is an absolute necessity um, and um, needs to be, additional protections need to be put in place. And so I'm happy to work with um, any of the advocacy organizations and activists to make sure that we are able to do so. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Congressman, yeah. the next question from our, uh, questions is, do you support providing undocumented immigrants driver's licenses? Yes, I do. Um, uh, this is a, um, an issue of, of basic dignity as far as I'm concerned. Um, I've met with advocates and activists on this issue for a long time now. I've supported driver's licenses for uh, undocumented immigrants for a long time now. But, um, just recently, Andrea, um, maybe about two weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago, um, I met with a woman in East Boston um, who told me that she got up every morning. She has a single mom of four children. She got up every morning to go to work. She was a driver, uh, rose about 4 a.m. And every morning when her children were still sleeping, she kissed them goodbye and didn't know if she would come home at night to be there for them um, because of the risk that she got pulled over. And she broke down in tears wondering who she would call to tell her children to try to care for her kids. Um, yes, we need to provide driver's licenses for the undocumented. Um, 
this is a additional form of exploitation that takes place um, in uh, throughout our system um, and throughout our economy. Um, and members of our, our community deserve that protection. And by the way, um, from a public safety standpoint, if people are gonna be driving, they might as well have actually gone through and, and been licensed appropriately. Um, so yes, 100% um, support. Um, I met with uh, advocates and, and activists outside um, the state house as they were protesting um, and demanding that Beacon Hill actually um, move that legislation. I called uh, a number of legislators there to try to uh, push that bill forward as well. Um, and so happy to uh, continue to support those efforts. This is uh, Rep. Kennedy. There has been many bills that will improve the conditions for incarcerated people and their loved ones. For example, free calls for incarcerated people and an act mm -hmm. and an act, free phone calls, an act to improve visitation, parole board reform, and decarceration. What efforts have you taken to support these efforts? Do you think these bills are important? And how much energy have you put into these bills? I think the bills are important. Um, most of uh, much of my work uh, has been focused at the federal level. Um, so where uh, that is the, the, the onus of my job and, and my jurisdiction. Um, and I think the federal reform efforts are critically important. We, um, but obviously uh, more needs to be done. With regard to the state level, um, uh, I do support those efforts that you've uh, you've uh, talked about or that you've mentioned. Um, and I think Massachusetts has a chance to uh, lead the way when it comes to state level reforms that can actually set the standard for a uh, humane uh, criminal justice system going forward. And if there's more there that um, advocates and activists think that I can do, uh, I'm very happy to, um, to try to engage and, and do more. Our next question. What is your position on the decriminalization of drugs? What strategies will you use to prevent ongoing punishment for the illness of addiction? And what will you do to address the legacy of the racist war on drugs? Yeah, so great question. Um, so um, I have not, um, I've come out as I, I think you all know for um, the legalization of marijuana. Um, I have, um, because of my work on um, with an addiction community, um, uh, I've been diving into some of the, the, the potentials, um, uh, well, addiction community and mental behavior health community. Um, I've been diving into some of the issues around um, the medicinal use of, of certain psychedelics that um, are, at least at this point, um, show some promise with regards to um, addressing issues on depression and, and particularly PTSD. Um, uh, I think more study there is needed, but um, the uh, initial research out of that is actually um, uh, quite promising, uh, which is, is wonderful news for folks suffering from, from those conditions and others. Um, clearly, when it comes to the war on drugs, we have seen enormous desperate impact um, for minorities in black and brown communities. That desperate impact needs to be addressed, period. Um, and it, needs, it means the, the full-on repeal of the 1994 crime bill. Um, and it, it means um, re-examining our criminal justice system, particularly a federal uh, criminal justice system, and addressing the uh, systemic ways in which uh, this system has led to the um, uh, to systematic injustice for um, for families that have lost a father or a mother to incarceration for um, for unjust purposes and unjust reasons. Um, so the um, I'm happy to engage more, obviously, uh, on these issues going forward. I do think that um, uh, if there's a lesson from uh, the past several years, it's clearly that the war on drugs is not working. Um, it is one of the reasons why I was focused on and have been focused on mental and behavioral health and addiction, because I saw that every day uh, in our justice system, that you will not prosecute your way out of this problem. You need to treat it. And people need to get access to the care that they need when they need it. And our mental behavior health care system has been structurally underinvested in and undersupported literally for decades. And the consequence of that is that uh, we arrest people uh, and we end up locking them up for a long time. And that's not humane. That's not right. That's not just. And that's not a solution. And that's the reason why one of the big reasons why I ran for office in the first place was to actually try to address those issues. We have a few more minutes to get in a couple more questions. There's a lot of questions, Congressman, just so you know. And I'll, I'll try to be quick. 
I'm, well, I'm doing my best also to try and just go back and forth and get them all in. Um, there is a question, Representative, about how do you reconcile being a former prosecutor and having a cop as your criminal justice advisor in a political climate that calls for community-led alternatives to the judicial system? So uh, I, I, I don't have a cop as a criminal justice advisor. I have a, one of the highest um, uh, African-American elected officials in Boston who is, has been a champion of criminal justice reform. Who are you supported by individuals congressman? Like Sh Sheriff Tompkins, Steve Tompkins. Um, he's been supported by folks like Ayanna Presley and Elizabeth Warren. Um, and I think Sheriff Tompkins' uh, insight here is valuable. He's obviously not the only um, person that I, I go to for issues around criminal justice reform. Um, um, so uh, I, the positions that I've uh, taken here tonight, I think are, uh, should be a reflection of my views about um, the ways in which uh, the reforms that are necessary in order to create a more just system. And the fact that I got into the, this, I ran for office in the first place because I saw the ways in which a system was failing our people. We were locking people up who were sick. We were locking people up who were poor. I, I remember being in a courtroom one day um, and a judge called out a defendant by name. And he asked him, I'll call him Jimmy. He asked him what he was doing back in court so quickly. He'd come in earlier that week and I think he'd stolen something out of a, uh, a store. And it was at that point about November or so. And he asked Jimmy if he was actually looking to be incarcerated and have his bail revoked so that he could spend the winter behind bars with uh, a hot place, a warm place to go to bed. If that is our criminal justice system, right, we have failed. And I got into, I ran for office because I saw the ways in which we are, our system was failing our people. Our mental health system does not exist and we lock people up for it. The largest providers of mental behavior health service in the country are the jails in LA and Chicago. That's not right and that's not just, and I'm trying to fix it. I'd like to take a little bit of, of, of privilege here, Congressman, just to uh, bear down a little bit on that question because it's coming from a community, a people-led assembly process. And, and I just, I think what they're asking, what, 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 what our community is going through here in Massachusetts on every level of representation by elected officials is a people's assembly process. And so what they're asking particularly is in addition to whoever else you are centering as your advisors in your campaign around criminal legal reform, do you think that it is important and will you commit to having people from the most directly affected community as advisors to your campaign, particularly around the issues of criminal legal reform and uh, reauthorization of funding into communities most directly affected? That, that's, what that, that's what that question was really trying to get at. Thank you, and forgive me for, for, for not addressing it that way then, uh, Andrea. So the sort of to that is yes. Um, and uh, over the course of this campaign, um, not only have we engaged with uh, a forum that you're probably aware of with Senator Markey at, at, the, um, uh, uh, at South Bay, at the House of Correction, um, but I've been up at the uh, facility in Essex as well. Uh, I've engaged um, through community activists with currently incarcerated indiv individuals to actually discuss um, reforms from folks who are currently incarcerated, their ideas for reform. Um, and I think it is critically important that um, policymakers um, do hear from incarcerated individuals about their experiences and how we are able to make this system uh, more right and more just. Absolutely. And so yes, unequivocally, yes is the answer to your question. We're coming down to the last two minutes of our time with you, Congressman. I'll ask one more question. Um, and that question will be, do you think it's possible to create meaningful reform during this political climate? Yes, um, I don't, not only possible, but uh, necessary. Look, I, in the midst of this political climate, I gave up my seat for that in the House of Representatives to jump into a race for Senate because I believe in our people and I believe in this moment and I believe that our people are so much better than the government and the country that we are seeing. And I believe in that reform. And, and look, the, I'll be brief here because I, I don't I don't have much time, but the most optimistic, you ask any of his colleagues, the most optimistic member of Congress 
by far was John Lewis, uh, a dear friend of mine and obviously a civil rights champion we, we said goodbye to last week. A man who had been arrested over 45 times, who had been let down over and over again by the people that he, who were supposed to protect him. I saw the police chief of Montgomery, Alabama, take off his badge and hand it to uh, Mr. Lewis for not protecting him when he was beaten as part of the Freedom Riders. And through it all, the fact that Mr. Lewis could still see goodness in everybody, through it all, the fact that he could still see his way uh, to fight for change, and that he saw the human capacity to change because of the blood and the sweat and the tears that he shed. So yes, I believe change is possible. Yes, I believe it's necessary. I got in this race to try to do my part to push us forward. Um, and I'm grateful to have that opportunity. Um, and I hope to have earned your support. So Andrea, thank you very, very much. Congressman Kennedy, thank you very much for the time that you have spent with us this evening. And we look forward to watching how things unfold. Thank you. Be well. Uh, we will be back. Uh, this is a halftime break. It's about five minutes. And um, we will open up again at um, about 8.05 is my understanding. And we will see you back here in just a few moments. Thank you. Criminal law reform. For mass incarceration reform. Restorative justice. Justice as healing. It is possible to live in a different world, to think of wrongdoing and rehabilitation differently. Understand that change without begins with the change within. The very instrument that could legitimately alter our circumstances is, of course, our minds. So what happens when our minds are preoccupied with processing our fortunate societal norms, such as systemic racism, joblessness, gun violence, institutional disenfranchisement, absentee fathers, mass incarceration, etc. We are being asked to thrive in conditions that are designed to break our will. A lot of people think that if they see a formerly incarcerated person or a few incarcerated stars, that they're somehow anomalies. And they're somehow just those. And we should do what we can for that one. We are not anomalies. We have a system that is roughly 70% of incarcerated people of color, largely African American, black identified, or Latinx community members, mm -hmm. um, and then 30% otherwise. And, you know, if you put that in the world, um, let's just say 10 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, most people would have been like, yeah, that sounds about right. You know, <laughs> that's where the crime is. Right. And so that's what we would expect our prisons to look like. Mm -hmm. But if you have a kind of racist, essentialist idea about various groups, then you'd have a problem explaining that in 1970, the number was reversed. Mm -hmm. That roughly 70% of our incarcerated population were actually white or European identified and people of color. So something pretty radical changed. Either all the white people became <laughs> really well behaved um, Stop committing in 1970, uh -huh. um, um, or all the black people just got so outrageously criminal uh, that with our limited crime, crime control dollars, we had to spend them differently. The abolition of prisons is a way of challenging what has become normalize in our relationship to prisons. That is to say, we want to change prisons. What do we say we, we're doing? What's the word that we use? Reform, prison reform. People have been talking about prison reform ever since the prison was invented. As a matter of fact, the prison was supposed to be a reform when it was invented. Um, and, and so abolition is a way of encouraging us to think differently uh, and not mechanically. Herman Wallace spent 41 years in solitary confinement in Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola, Louisiana, until in 2013, a judge found his original indictment to be unconstitutional. For 41 years, he spent up to 23 hours a day in a cell that was six feet by nine feet. We spend $2 million to execute a murder. 
And yet, when a man come out of prison, they give him nothing. No clothes, give him a bus ticket. I think $10, they took the $10 back. It is designed for that man or that woman to go back. Because when I came home, if it wasn't for people that embraced me and gave me a chance and saw that there was something better than me than that sentence that was behind me, like that Corey law, then I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. Without further ado, Senator, I would like to welcome you. Senator Maki has served in the United States Senate since 2013 and has consistently delivered for the people of Massachusetts throughout his career. Senator Maki has worked towards much needed criminal justice reform, recognizing that the justice system disproportionately incarcerates black Americans and people of color. He co-sponsored Senator Cory Booker's Next Step Act and is working to create comprehensive reform to sentencing guidelines, prison conditions, law enforcement training, and increased funding for prisoner reentry. Senator Maki is supportive of reinstating the right to vote in federal elections for formerly incarcerated individuals and expunging the records for those who are unfairly incarcerated as a result of the failed war on drugs. Senator, thank you for joining us and welcome. Please, thank Senator. Thank you, Andrea, so much. And thank you for all of your great work uh, and for organizing this, I agree with you, very important, timely forum on these issues. We're at a turning point in our country's history. It's not just the buildings that are smoldering, uh, it's the very soul of our country, which is on fire. Uh, and we know uh, that we have to do something about the conditions in our country. We can see who the most vulnerable people are. They're poorer, uh, they're black, they're brown, they're immigrants, they're essential workers. They've been hit the hardest. Uh, and we have to make sure in the light of the murder of George Floyd, uh, that families have the ability uh, to make the police accountable. And that's the legislation which Elizabeth Warren and Ayanna Presley and I have introduced. We, wrote, we know right now that we're 5% of the world's population in the United States, but we have 25% of the prisoners in the world. That is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, we're 5% of the world's population. One in three women in the world are behind bars in the United States. That is just unacceptable. We can, you can tell a lot about a nation by who it imprisons. In some countries, it's political prisoners, journalists. In, in the United States, we disproportionately imprison those who are black, who are brown, who are poor, who have mental illnesses, uh, who uh, have addiction issues, and they wind up in prison. And we just have to change this system because in disproportionate numbers, we can see who gets harmed. And people all across our country are marching, they're chanting, they're praying, they're raising their voices. So that's why Senator Cory Booker and I have introduced the Next Step Act. He and I are the two co-sponsors of this bill. Uh, and it will do this. It will reduce harsh mandatory minimums for nonviolent drug offenses. It will eliminate the disparity between crack and powdered cocaine sentences. It's 18 times higher for crack cocaine than for powdered cocaine. It will end the federal prohibition on marijuana, expunge records, and reinvest in communities most harmed by the war on drugs. It will ban the box by prohibiting federal employers and contractors from asking a job applicant about their criminal history until the very final stages of the interview process so that formerly incarcerated prisoners get a fair and more objective shot at finding meaningful employment. It removes the barriers for people with criminal convictions to receiving an oc occupational license uh, for jobs such as hairdressers and taxi drivers. It reinstates the right to vote in federal elections for formerly incarcerated prisoners. It creates a federal pathway for sealing the records of nonviolent drug offenses for adults and automatically sealing, and in some cases, expunging juvenile records. And it ensures that anyone released from federal prison receives meaningful assistance in obtaining a photo ID, birth certificate, social security card, a work authorization 
uh, documents. And it provides better training for law enforcement officers in implicit racial bias, de-escalation, and use of force. It advance racial and religious uh, profiling, and it improves the reporting of police use of force incidents. So Cory Booker and I, we've introduced this legislation. Uh, and, uh, and our goal is going to be, once we get rid of Donald Trump, once we fumigate the Senate of Republican control, that that's the agenda for next year to ensure that our criminal justice system actually deserves the word justice uh, being attached to it. So I thank you all so much for giving me the opportunity to be here with you this evening and uh, look really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Senator. And now we will move to uh, Jennifer, who will be asking, uh, presenting the panelists who will be asking questions. Okay, first up, we have Ramilda Pereira, who is a formerly incarcerated Boston resident, mother of two, and a director of programs at Families for Justice as Healing. Ramilda, your question. Thank you. Good evening, Congressman Markey. In April 2020, Andrea Circlebeer, serving a 26-month federal sentence for drugs, died as a result of COVID-19. Just 28 days after giving birth via C-section while on a ventilator. In addition to her newborn daughter, she left behind five other children. Her 26-month her drug sentence turned into a death sentence, leaving her children without their mother. Six states, including Massachusetts, have passed parenting sentencing alternatives to divert parents and caregivers from incarceration into programs that would better service them and their families. We hear that after the August congressional re recess, a federal parenting sentencing alternative bill will be introduced by Representative Japal and Senator Wyden. Will you support that bill? And also, have you supported the current ask for appropriations for states working on parenting sentencing alternatives? Um. Yes, I will. I will support um, that legislation. Uh, children and families must be kept together at all costs. Um, we need to ensure uh, that we deal with the reality that, especially in this case that you're talking about with women, that it, it many times has a profound impact upon children in the same family. And that's why the whole policy right now should just be compassionate release. If there's any risk that there's a danger to being exposed to COVID uh, that could lead to illness, that could lead to death, the, the, the ripple effect negative consequences are absolutely massive. So my uh, belief uh, is that uh, we have to ensure that we uh, uh, use compassionate release uh, and that's why I'm going to be supporting uh, Senator Wyden's bill, which is the Senate version of this bill, uh, so that we support the children, that we support the parents of the children, uh, so that they can do their absolute best to make sure that there isn't a, a catastrophic consequence uh, that results from incarceration. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up, we have Jarrell Lorenell. <clears throat> a formerly incarcerated organizer at Families for Justice as Healing and a survivor of solitary confinement who focuses on implementing alternative responses to interpersonal harm outside of police and prisons. Jarrell, your question. Thank you, Jennifer. How you doing, Senator? Hey, how you doing? Great. Good. Uh, two years after the passage of the First Step Act, we've continued to see the Trump administration aggressively prosecute and sentence individuals for drugs and slow walk or fail to exercise its authority to grant home confinement to individuals at high risk for COVID-19. Even here in Massachusetts, during a pandemic, when the economy has been flatlined, there is increased funding to the Department of Correction and no meaningful investments in black and brown communities. In addition, Massachusetts Governor Baker is proposing to build a new $50 million women's prison, and there's a proposal for a new jail in Suffolk County. Congre Congressman Markey, you have stated that one of your criminal justice priorities is to reinvest in communities. Specifically, what are you doing about this as a priority? 
And do you support the campaign to stop the new woman's prison in Massachusetts until we first determine what else is possible to decarcerate women and shift the $50 million prison building budget into a community-led initiatives? Yeah, thank you. And uh, as you heard in my opening, when I was talking about the fact that one in three women imprisoned in the world are imprisoned in the United States, um, it's just absolutely um, wrong. So we don't need any new jails. Uh, we need to move from incarceration to education. Uh, we need to uh, focus upon prevention and alternatives uh, to incarceration. So from my perspective, uh, you put your finger right on it especially with regard to uh, new jail cells for, uh, for women in the state of Massachusetts, we have to find a way to reduce the number of women who are being put in to behind bars in the Commonwealth. Uh, that's, that's why I partnered with uh, Rachel Rollins, the district attorney of Suffolk County, in, in working to find uh, better ways of dealing with this issue, but building a, a new jail is not a good way to solve that problem. So I, I agree with you, Terrell, thank you. Thank you. We have Leslie Creedle, a formerly incarcerated mother who lost her daughter to gun violence while she was incarcerated inside a federal prison. Leslie, your question. Good evening, Senator Markey. Good evening. I sit before you as a survivor mom who is incarcerated when my 22-year-old daughter, Brianna, was killed by violence. I am also a person who does not believe in locking people up and throwing away the key. From experience, I know that prisons do not equate to individual accountability and public safety. Would you, Senator, publicly call for Massachusetts and federally to end life without parole sentences? Yes, I, I don't believe um, that in Massachusetts we should have um, life without parole. We, we have to create a world where everyone has a chance to, uh, to redeem themselves, uh, to show uh, that they can re-enter into society. Uh, and I think that that is the only way in which we should be thinking about these issues. And from my perspective, uh, we should be first in line uh, in the country in thinking in this way. Uh, again, we have an over-incarceration problem uh, in our country. It is absolutely imperative um, that we take your advice uh, and we move uh, Leslie in uh, that direction. I'm so sorry about your loss um, to violence. Um, we should be thinking of better and smarter ways uh, of preventing violence, preventing the need for uh, incarceration. But if, if people are incarcerated, there has to be a hope for parole. There has to be some a reason to, to live. And ultimately, I believe that we should be the model for creating that kind of a system in Massachusetts. Agree. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Quinn, who is a survivor of incest, who entered the sex trade at the age of 15 after leaving her home, and is now an organizer with the Sex Workers Outreach Project in Boston. Quinn, your question. Hi, Senator. I come to you hidden because the criminalization of me and my fellow workers makes it dangerous to show my face. I come to you hidden I have never been voiceless. In 2018, I and thousands of fellow workers lobbied, called, and organized to prevent the passage of FOSTA-SESTA, a bill that claimed to hold online platforms accountable for their role in sex trafficking, without consideration for the necessity of these platforms for protection and well-being of both consensual sex workers and trafficking victims. As a coalition, we opposed the bill as a result in sex workers being systematically removed from internet platforms, taking away our ability to control how we work 
and destroyed networks that re we relied on for safety and security. Workers became more vulnerable as we simultaneously lost our income and resources that allowed us to communicate with and protect one another, leading to more of us in poverty, more of us living on the streets, more of us being trafficked, and even some of us being killed. Now that FOSTA SESTA is a law and causing further harm to those who it was intended to protect, and in light of the advancing new federal bill, the PROTECT Act, that we continue to be concerned about, do you support the full decriminalization of sex work on the state and federal level? Uh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, there is a spectrum of sex work that ranges from trafficking to consensual sex work and the most marginalized uh, members of the LGBTQ community, including transgender individuals, people of color, uh, LGBTQ youth are disproportionately represented um, in sex work. Uh, and we know that um, SESTA FOSTA has negatively impacted people who once worked online to seek safe sex work conditions. Uh, this, is a, this is an area here where, in my opinion, uh, it's necessary uh, to ensure that this argument for eliminating trafficking, which was compelling, but now it's our responsibility to listen to sex workers and advocates to work together on how to move forward. Uh, and, and I support that effort to uh, decriminalize. Um, so that uh, we're able to uh, deal more, more, uh, more justly with the individuals who uh, are in uh, the sex work sector. Next up, we have Harold Adams, who is a formerly incarcerated person and the founder of Boston's community of friends and relatives of prisoners. Harold, your question. Uh, hello, uh, Senator. Uh, I, uh, I served 31 years in prison in Massachusetts. I became a jailhouse lawyer during that time. Uh, I was able to get seven people out of prison through studying the law. The Constitution affords the right of access to the courts. No other politically unpopular group has had their access to the courts restricted in the way that incarcerated persons have to ensure that all incarcerated persons can pursue legal remedies to unjust conditions would you author or co-sponsor legislation to repeal the prison litigation act to ensure all incarcerated persons can pursue legal remedies to unjust conditions yeah, absolutely uh, there has to be a right for people who are incarcerated uh, to be able to exercise their constitutional rights. They, they have to have an ability uh, to be able to have legal recourse. And for somebody like you, who for 41 years has been playing that role, you know uh, that this system uh, is one that should allow uh, for those who are incarcerated to be able to raise issues that otherwise would never be raised. So yes, I agree with you 100%. That should be, um, that should be something that we provide in our country for everyone, including those who are incarcerated so that they may exercise their constitutional rights. So my answer is yes. And thank you, Harold. Thank you for raising it. Thank you for 41 years Right, thank you, Senator. It was actually 31, but thank you. Oh, 31 years, but the, and you said that, and you said that uh, you were able to um, free how many people? Seven. Seven people. Yes. Because of your work. Well, thank you for that. And it only goes to show that the rights of the incarcerated should be given the full protection of anyone who is not incarcerated, and you are living proof that, if given the opportunity. There are, there's a lot of injustice which is built into the criminal justice system in our country. So thank you so much, uh, Harold, for all your great work. Thank you, Senator. Okay, next up we have Cassandra 
Ben Saeed, who is the coordinator of Massachusetts Against Solitary and the senior organizer for Unitary, Unitarian Universalist Mass Action Network, a formerly incarcerated mother and a member of Families for Justice as Healing, who has been working on criminal justice reform for 11 plus years. Cassandra, your question. Thank you, Jennifer. Senator Markey, solitary confinement has been in practice in jails and prisons under various names, such as SHU, segregated housing units, SMU, special management units, DDU, the department disciplinary unit, administrative segregation and restrictive housing. Solitary confinement is disproportionately used against black and brown people, people with disabilities, LGBTQ plus individuals, religious minorities, and people with mental illnesses and ICE detainees. Studies have shown that regardless of what it's called, short and long-term isolation causes long lasting physical and psychological harm to men, women, and children on top of the trauma of being incarcerated. Solitary confinement has been recognized as a form of torture by the United Nations. Senator Markey, would you author or co-sponsor legislation to end the torturous practice of solitary confinement? Yeah, yes, uh, I would, Cassandra. And uh, thank you for that, I think, excellent question. Because as you point out, for the rest of the world, they consider solitary confinement to be torture. Uh, and here in the United States, uh, it's just a matter of practice. And so, uh, so what, what we should be doing is dealing with these issues from a healthcare perspective, from a mental healthcare perspective. When people uh, are put in solitary confinement, in many instances, uh, it's because they have issues that need treatment. Uh, and that's what we should be funding. We should be funding the healthcare side of this issue. Uh, we know that 85% of the people who are, uh, who are incarcerated have some relationship with substance abuse. You know, and that's almost always correlated with mental health issues. What happens operationally, however, is the prison system then looks at them and says, well, they're black, they're brown, they're LGBTQ, they have, dis they have disabilities, you know, they are, they're, they're ICE prisoners, they're immigrants, we'll just put them in solitary. That's not realistic, you know? My wife is a psychiatrist. My wife was the chief of behavioral medicine at the National Institutes of Health. What we need to do is to ensure uh, that we are providing the care for prisoners. And, and, and I will just say this, it's one of the reasons why, you know, I've introduced legislation to make sure that uh, people who don't, who can't make bail, they keep their medical treatment. People who are in, uh, in prison, they keep their medical treatment. And once people leave, they get it immediately so that they're able to stay inside the medical system the whole way. So my answer to you is yes, I will uh, sponsor legislation to abolish solitary confinement. Uh, it's wrong. Uh, the rest of the world has that conclusion already. But again, it just keeps coming back to the fact that in our country, uh, we believe as a philosophy in incarceration. And it's a proven pathway to failure in our society. And solitary confinement is just the, 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 the natural extension of this misguided thinking in our society. So my answer to you is yes, absolutely. It should be abolished and I will support legislation uh, to accomplish that goal. It is the only humane way uh, for us to be treating prisoners. So thank you so much. It, it causes more problems, in my opinion, than it solves. You know, a mental health problem then just accelerates uh, the 
it gets exasperated. It's even worse uh, uh, after solitary confinement. So let us, let's just. Um, Thank you so much. We will do everything we can uh, to abolish solitary confinement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman, and thank you. We have, um, we're, we're proud of this event as we've already uh, commented earlier because of its historic significance. Um, and because this is part of and a demonstration of what a people's assembly process looks like that includes the people speaking to those who are uh, the electeds. And that includes also um, in our organizing work, Senator, the voices of our people who are inside of prisons, of incarcerated people. I would like to introduce to you, Senator, uh, Derek Washington. Derek is incarcerated at Susan Baranowski in Massachusetts. He's serving a life without parole sentence and working to restore the voting rights of incarcerated people in Massachusetts. Here is Derek Washington, Senator. Hi, right, my name is Derek Washington and it's indeed a pleasure just to have this opportunity to share my thoughts and provide some insight about incarcerated suffrage. Um, at Sousa Baranowski, these conditions are horrible. It's beyond punishment. It's, it's continuous torture, to say the least. I believe the conditions are the way they are because we don't have representation. Representation simply just being able to pick the people who make the laws that govern our everyday environments. And because we can't do that, we don't have representatives, we don't have legislators, we don't have public officials coming in here looking at the food we eat, the brown water we drink, us not being able to see our mothers, our kids, our families, our siblings for months on end. We're locked down 30 plus hours from day to day recreation. We have racist CEOs, openly racist, who come to work and express their hate towards black and brown people that they can't express on in society because there's camera phones that capture all the bullshit, the, the BS that they do. But I think voting, in fact, I'm sure voting, having that representation will be a way to snuff that behavior out. And I think a society is only as good as those at the bottom of it. So to invest into society is to... Is, it's to invest into those incarcerated by providing them the vote, teaching them to value their society by allowing them to engage in civic duties, teaching them, educating them. So my position is, where do y'all stand on incarcerated suffrage? Because without suffrage, we're suffering. Well, thank you, um, Derek, so much for that question. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm committed to ending mass incarceration in our country. So many people are there uh, because we um, we conducted this war on drugs, and we owe, we owe an apology to an entire generation uh, of uh, African American young men. We just owe an apology to them. But but one of the ways in which we should begin to rectify that, and that's what I talked about earlier with regard to the, uh, the legislation that I've introduced with uh, Cory Booker, uh, it's that uh, we just end this racist, uh, felony, um, disenfranchisement that we have in our country. There are 6.1 million people who have lost their right to vote in our country. Uh, and it's because of um, felony charges and it threatens our very democracy, it threatens our values, it threatens who we are as a society. And I know that those felony disenfranchisement decisions are all very directly related uh, to efforts to criminalize being black in the United States of America. And we just have to end it. We have to just say that black lives matter, Black voices matter, black votes matter, black votes matter. Uh, and because of an out of control criminal system, 
six million people have lost their right to vote. Uh, and we just have to end this. Uh, we have to restore the right to vote. We have to make it possible for people to be able to register their views in a democracy uh, on criminal justice issues and other issues, but on criminal justice issues because, you know, who is an expert more than someone who has been a part of this system? And I believe ultimately in human rights and dignity and equity, and I strongly support abolishing uh, felony um, disenfranch disenfranchisement in our country. Uh, and I will work to accomplish that goal. And it's something, again, that Cory Booker and I uh, speak about and that we want to make uh, a part of, uh, of the fabric of our, our society that we have to begin to construct beginning on January 20th of 2021. We, did, we have to move from being an incarceration society uh, to one that uh, deals uh, with these issues uh, in the criminal justice system in a much more humane and fair way and restoring people's right to vote should be at the top of the list. Thank you, Congressman Maki. We have reached the end of our panelist questions and we are moving now into our phase of questions from the audience. Our first question for you, Senator, is, Senator Maki, how will you include formerly incarcerated people in your process moving forward and in decision making in your office? How will you engage with your constituents who are most impacted by, incarcer by incarceration, including residents of the most incarcerated corridor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that spans from Nubian Square to Franklin Hill, Franklin Field? Um. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, I would begin by partnering with uh, District Attorney Rachel Rollins, um, who is, I would call her the pioneer in the United States of America uh, in, uh, in trying to have a complete reevaluation made of the defects in our criminal justice system. Uh, and then partnering with her uh, to listen to those who are, have been formerly incarcerated or are incarcerated right now. I was over at Suffolk County Jail just about three weeks ago talking to 25 or 30 uh, prisoners uh, in an effort to hear their views uh, on uh, the criminal justice system and what needs to be done. Uh, and I think that we need more forums like this. Um, I think that I think it's going to be imperative for me uh, and anyone who's interested in in overhauling this system to listen to the voices of the people who are the experts and those are the people who have been incarcerated, uh, so that we uh, can change our system uh, for the better and permanently moving forward. And that's my commitment to you that that I will come to the community so I can hear what in fact should be changed in this system. And I look forward to those four uh, in the future so that uh, we can together partner uh, to overhaul our criminal justice system. Thank you, Senator. Our next question from the question uh, box is Senator Maki. I have yet to hear you give a reason for why you voted for the 1994 crime bill. That bill caused so much pain for thousands in our country, incarcerating more people for longer sentences. Why did you vote for it? What will you do now to address that harm? Yeah, well, the, the entire Massachusetts uh, congressional delegation voted for that bill, uh, including Senator Kennedy. Uh, Joe Biden voted for it, Nancy Pelosi voted for it. And the reason that our entire delegation voted for it was that for the first time, there was a Violence Against Women's Act provision <coughs> built into the law. Uh, there was also a ban on assault weapons that was built into that law. But yes, without question, uh, those sentencing provisions uh, were wrong. 
Uh, and that's why I said we owe an apology to an entire generation of African-American young men uh, because of that over-incarceration that has occurred. <clears throat> and it's also why, uh, again, coming back to my work with uh, Cory Booker, Senator Cory Booker, that we've introduced the Next Step Act. <clears throat> One of the earlier questioners talked about how uh, under the First Step Act, Trump is still out there uh, arresting and incarcerating people in an indiscriminate way. And uh, in trusting Trump, trusting you know, Republican prosecutors, especially across this country, <clears throat> is a fool's error. So from my perspective, that's why we need uh, the Next Step Act, which I've already referred to, uh, where we have to go back in. And, and as I said earlier, there is an 18 to 1 sentencing guideline differential between crack cocaine and powdered cocaine. And we know why, because powdered cocaine is a white suburban drug. And crack cocaine is punished at 18 times higher. So we've got to stop right there because so much of the incarceration is drug related. Uh, and that's what Cory Booker and I are absolutely committed to doing. But then as I, as I went through all the provisions earlier in, in my opening, I won't repeat them all. Uh, we have to think comprehensively uh, about what we do uh, to make sure uh, that everyone gets the opportunities which they need in our society. And that's changing the licensing uh, uh, rules that we have. Uh, it's making sure that we uh, once and for all uh, look at the bail issues uh, and, and make sure that uh, poor people who can't make bail aren't almost automatically put into uh, the, um, the prison system. Uh, we should be abolishing um, cash bail uh, in our country. Uh, we shouldn't be taking away medical benefits from people who can't put up the cash bail. That's what happens right now in our criminal justice system. We just have to look at this, this in an entirety uh, and make sure that we, once and for all, just admit that there's something wrong, again, when 25% of the prisoners in the world are behind bars in the United States. And we can just look back at those sentencing guidelines, amongst other things that have led to that problem. Thank you, Congressman. Want to just uh, get to a couple more questions before our time is up. Um, Senator Maki, you were a congressman at the time that an African-American man, DJ Henry, was murdered by Officer Aaron Hess. The Henry family felt dismissed by your inaction and his loved ones continue to seek justice for DJ. What would you have done differently to hold law enforcement accountable for DJ's murder and what will you do now? Well, I, I strongly support the Henry family's efforts to reopen the case of the murder of their beloved son, DJ Henry. I cannot fathom the pain they must be feeling watching news about all the families who have lost loved ones murdered by the police. The Henrys have survived something that no parent should ever have to experience, the loss of a child. I joined with the other members of the Massachusetts delegation in 2014 in calling on the Department of Justice, Eric Holder, uh, to open a federal investigation. Uh, into DJ Henry's murder. And I'm again calling on the Attorney General uh, to do his job and offer justice to the Henry family and open this long overdue investigation. Uh, I've reached out to the Henry family to offer my sincerest apologies and to pledge to them my complete support to take action on this case. And I am fully at their disposal and I hope to work with them in the future. Thank you, Congressman. What is your position on reinstating federal parole? On, on reinstating, could, could they elaborate a little bit? Federal parole was, uh, we have now uh, supervised release, we have probation, federal parole was eradicated. And the question is, would you support the reinstatement of 
federal parole? The answer to that question is yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, Senator Markey, uh, Massachusetts is home to one of the largest Southeast Asian communities in the United States. After facing violence and genocide in Southeast Asia, many of these individuals resettled in the US into underfunded neighborhoods with a lack of structural support and systemic violence pushed many Southeast Asians to commit crimes of varying degrees. After rebuilding their lives, these community members are now being funneled into the prison to deportation pipeline, facing deportation as a result of past criminal records. What actions are you taking to respond to the Southeast Asian community members impacted by continued detentions and deportations during the pandemic? Well, I was the first uh, to call, I, would, I was the first Senator to call for uh, no deportations during the, um, during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and, uh, and I also believe, by the way, uh, that uh, people uh, should be released from detention during the coronavirus, uh, where there are no major crimes that have been committed. Uh, it's dangerous to have people uh, who are in prison during this time, and we should definitely not have uh, uh, people who are being deported at this time as well. So I was the first senator in both instances, both in detention and with regard to deportation, uh, to stand up uh, and to say that, that those practices have to end. And it's true for the Southeast Asian community, but it should be true across the board uh, for any, uh, uh, any immigrant population in the United States of America. I just believe uh, that we have to have a more humane philosophy at this time that we are using. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that is something that I call for now five months ago in terms of deportation. Will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for all police officers and prison guard and prison guards in the United States immediately? Well, you know, Elizabeth Warren and I have introduced uh, the legislation in the United States Senate to abolish qualified immunity. And uh, we, um, we're intent on seeing that become the law. Ayanna Presley, uh, introduced similar legislation uh, in the United States House of Representatives. So it's our goal uh, to take uh, this now distorted policy uh, and to uh, eliminate it in our country. You know, back in 1871, uh, in that brief period of time where civil rights laws were in fact passed and put on the books, uh, there was a statute that allowed for suing of public officials if they did something wrong. And what, uh, what happened over the years, uh, as you know, is that the Supreme Court of the United States slowly but surely chipped away at the rights of families to be able to sue, to be able to hold these police officers prison guards accountable for what they had done. So from my perspective, it is absolutely imperative uh, that we provide justice for families uh, in our country, that we give them the ability to be able to make these officials accountable to them, since they are the ones who lost their loved one, who had a loved one who was harmed. They should be able to sue. They should be able to uh, make them accountable. So, so Elizabeth Warren and I, we are the two co-sponsors. Originally, it was Kamala Harris uh, and Cory Booker and I who introduced legislation uh, as, a, as, a, as a resolution to be able to accomplish that. Uh, and from my perspective, I think that that's what we have to do. Next January, we need, we need to have a new agenda for our country. And it's got to be justice. It's got to be criminal justice uh, reform in our country. It's got to be qualified immunity, which is removed. It's got to be uh, healthcare justice, educational justice, economic justice, 
It's got to be environmental justice. Justice is on the ballot this November, which is why we have to get rid of this racist, uh, criminally negligent president. And then next January, at noon, on January 20th, we have to begin a process of putting justice into law in our country. And the repeal of qualified immunity is a big part of it, but we have to just keep going down the list in order to make sure that we take each and every one of these issues and we have our own FDR moment. This is a moment of reckoning in our country. And qualified immunity is part of that. And Elizabeth and I are committed, as is Ayanna, to repealing it. Uh, but we have to go further than that uh, to make sure that we, uh, we look at every single place where structural racism is built into our system. And we know that the criminal justice system is the best example of how black and brown people do not receive full justice in our country. And that has to be our goal next year. We have time for just one more uh, quick question. And I have so many questions that we were not able to get to. Um, and I'm looking through to find a question that we could answer in a short period of time. But how will you, uh, what are your plans, Congressman, to uh, help youth of color in this country, particularly in communities that have been most directly affected by um, the criminal legal system of the war on drugs. Uh, what are your plans for uh, creating um, opportunities for youth of color? Well, I'll begin with this right now. As the lead Democratic author of the telecommunications laws, I created a program in 1996 called the E-Rate, the Internet Rate which is a $54 billion program, which puts the internet on the desk of every child in America. That's my program, $54 billion. Roxbury, Mattapan, Dorchester, Chelsea, Malden, poor kids got that technology at the same rate as rich kids. Well, right now, there's 12 million kids at home in our country without the internet. And that's gonna learn, lead to a homework gap, that's gonna lead to a learning gap, that's going to lead to an opportunity gap for all of these kids. So right now I'm down here in Washington and I'm gonna be battling for $4 billion to make sure that every young person, especially black, brown, poor immigrant kids get access to it. Otherwise we're gonna create a catastrophe in this country. Uh, these young people are going to get left further and further behind. It's gonna impair their ability to take advantage of opportunities in their lives. And I have right now all 47 Democrats signed up with me and we're drawing the line behind my bill to make sure uh, that we get that help to kids, not only on the school desk, but there's no guarantee kids will be in school full time. It's got to be at home too. We can't leave 12 million kids behind. We know who they are, we can see them right now. And then we have to intentionally make sure that community college is free, that public, uh, uh, public colleges in America are free, uh, that we have the job training programs that are free. Uh, and I have one bill called dual enrollment, where if you are at Madison Park uh, and, uh, and you're interested in some subject, that you can take a course at community college for free at Bunker Hill Community College, Roxbury Community College. We want to get these kids in early so that they feel uh, that we respect them and that they know that we believe in them. My father drove a truck for the Hood Mill Company. It wasn't on the scoreboard that I would be a United States Senator. I know the same thing is true for every kid out there. And so it begins with education. It begins with ensuring that we're able to, to, uh, uh, to take care of every one of them. I went back to uh, 88 Phillips Street where my father grew up when I announced for the Senate. He grew up on the first floor of a triple decker in uh, South Lawrence. And I rang the doorbell to see who lives there now. My father's son is a United States Senator. And out onto the porch came a Dominican family with their children. And the accents were different, but the aspirations clearly the same for that family as for the Martin family. Thank so my you. belief is that we have to ensure that we have a democratization of access to opportunity through healthcare, through education, breaking down discriminatory barriers, 
uh, so that every child has what they need and that we stop. Thank you. Prevent the future and repair historic oppression in our country. That is my promise to young people in Boston and all across the Commonwealth and our country. Thank you for coming and spending this time with us, for answering the questions, and um, we appreciate your presence here. And we also want to say to everybody um, who's joined us this evening um, uh, for this historic event here in Massachusetts, we want to thank all of our organizations that have worked so tirelessly to pull this together. Citizens for Juvenile Justice, Families for Justice as Healing, Disability Action, the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute, Black and Pink Boston, Sisters Unchained, the Urban League, and of course, our sponsors at WGBH Forum Network and the Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. This was a most important event this evening. We thank all of you for joining us. We thank our audience. Thank you for all of your uh, brilliant and, and, and provocative questions. And we want to say to everybody, let's stay tuned, let's stay engaged, uh, and let's see how things play out. Thank you again, Senator, for joining us. And thank, thank you. you, everyone. Onward. <laughs>